welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Very excited. So excited. I'm actually going to leave this part on. I'm not editing this out because I am so excited about this. Uh, but I'm Jessica, community <laughs> media library, Syosset. Um, and I'm here with my coworker, Stacy, uh, technology and applications manager, if we're giving titles. <laughs> cool. And our guest today, before I have you introduce yourself and what we're oh, the, the theme song we song. created specifically yeah. for you all right so if, for any slim shady fans so it's guess who's back back again josh is back josh mallerman so. <laughs> welcome back <laughs> I, I heard the beat behind that i like totally heard the beat behind that <laughs> <laughs> well because we we love having you at our library so totally same 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 <laughs> also real fast this is i think i've only done like one interview for daphne so far so or one or two so you know with something like bird box at some point and i never take any of it for granted but at some point you know the questions that are coming yeah yeah, yeah. You're kind of you're you're responding to them how you do with daphne i i don't know what you're gonna ask Ooh. Talk about. And, that, and that's like that's that's freaky and that's fun well, okay, so we are talking about Daphne with Josh and Helen. <laughs> Sorry, I like how you just got very up close. <laughs> Listeners, we do our recording on Zoom, so sometimes there's video, and Jessica's face just got right up in the camera. That's how excited she is. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a book that, uh, first of all, I love all of Josh's books, and I literally cannot stop thinking about this book, which is extremely crazy because that is a big part of the story of Daphne. Um, so if you want to dive right in, because I know this is something Stacy wanted to know too, uh, where did this all come from? We've got like this amazing slasher, urban legend. It's so good. Coming of age. Coming of age. Um, man, it, it, it started like, I feel like in, how do I explain this? Like a book like Bird Box, someone might say, hey, is this about, you know, if you look outside of the world, you go crazy. And I'd be like, I, if that's what you think it is, you know, right, that kind of thing. You just write the book and you see what it's about later. But Daphne was the opposite. Like I knew right away that Daphne was a panic attack on her way, like right away. And the idea of... <sighs> The idea of personifying that and, and the way I think about, you know, my own experience with these things, and we can go way more in depth with, with anxiety and panic if you guys want. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way I see it, 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 it is kind of like you think about it for a second and you're like, oh, shoot. Uh oh, oh, fuck. You know, like I thought about it now. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then that seemed suddenly an easy thing to personify for me. If the more I think about this thing, the closer she's getting and the closer he's coming. So Daphne did start that way. Couple that with, you know, I'm a huge basketball fan and always have been. And um, couple those together and I was like, okay, I need, a, I need, you know, I didn't know Kit at the time, obviously, but that I knew that I was gonna have a group of athletes and, and one of them, especially um, a panic attack is on its way. and and you know again for the for probably the first time in in all these books i don't feel i don't feel weird saying that i don't feel weird saying like that's what it's about instead of like well what do you see no it's about anxiety <laughs> it's very very well written like i was talking to jessica about this earlier and i have a few friends that suffer from anxiety and panic attacks i've never had like a big one like myself, but I feel like everyone has like some sort of low level baseline of anxiety and reading about how she goes through everything. It really made me relate to friends and family that, that do suffer from it. And I, I've had a, one of my really good friends for years, we, we did birth rate together, like, oh my God, like 10 years ago. Wow. I feel old, but she had an attack while we were away. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I, is this gonna, is this gonna help? Or this, but to know that 
wait, when you say birthright, you mean Israel? Yeah. Wow, you went there? Yeah. Holy cow. So I can do that. And I've never done that. My half brother has. And my dad is doing it like in a couple months. Ah, small world. Wow, but yeah, yeah no, I, I did it. Yeah, because my, my really good friend wanted to go. And I was like, well, my sister did it. So I should go to the homeland. Um, and oh, we went cool. and we she we were doing good on the trip like she's traveled before you know she's been out of the country this wasn't her first time but there's a point in the trip where you kind of stay at like a bedouin um tent village you have like some tea coffee whatnot a lot of camels and she started she got an anxiety attack while we were there and i was like um I th- she happened to catch me as i'm like getting ready for bed so um you could tell in the video right now that I'm wearing glasses I normally wear contacts so I have like my one contact in I have like hit my pajama pants on but like a regular shirt on I was like what like I don't I don't know how to help you I don't know what you're feeling like I'm sorry and her yeah. roommate happened to come on the trip and was like no I got this like well that, to that, understand that can I ask a income. couple questions was yeah was part of her thing like we're so far from home we're in the middle of nowhere like those kind of things was yeah that- yeah that definitely because when Allison and I went to um Rio the drummer on my band beforehand was he had he's traveled a lot and he kind of like warned me he's like just so you know there may be a moment out there where you feel like really far from home and I was like what really and it totally happened you there's this moment out there where you're like whoa dude we're like I you can't just turn around and like oh I'm gonna go home from this party yep. it would take like a day or two to get home right um I know that feeling well. And I also know the other side, which is what you're saying, where like when someone is experiencing something like that, because you're not, not only does it look like, hey, you're going to be fine, but it almost it almost feels like unnecessary because you're like to the person you're like, I mean, we're in Israel. We're having fun. Like, like, what are you down about? What are you freaked out about? What are you because you're not feeling it as well? Yeah. Because these things are unseen. These things are invisible. These things are like. Daphne climbing the stairs with right next to the mom and the mom doesn't even see her. Yes. Or Melanie, but Melanie sees her. <laughs> oh, so and, as, yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. And I have to, I have to interject here because as somebody who does um, suffer from anxiety and has had panic attacks for a very long time, you, you made a point and this is kind of one of the things I think that resonated with me so much about Daphne. First of all, I have to say, When I was a kid, I was the kid who believed every urban legend somebody (laughs) told me. I did not, like Bloody Mary was going to come out of the um, mirror and get me. And, you know, like every, every urban legend was like in my mind. And I would constantly freak out about these things. But I also have suffered from like generalized anxiety disorder. And when somebody asks you a question, what are you what are you anxious about like that's I, I don't think people realize that it's not it, it's that's not an easy thing to answer because anxiety isn't necessarily about one thing there are focal points that you kind of get into but then there's also like that sense of impending doom and it's right. so hard right. to describe right because if it you know, glory be if it was just one singular thing, like uh, I have to give a speech or um, I, you know, I'm nervous about running into this old friend or whatever, whatever it is. It's not like that. It's this like overarching sense of, as you said, doom. And you, the biggest trick of anxiety and, it, and it's every single time is that you believe it every time. You believe it every time. So if you've gotten through it a hundred if you got through it a thousand times in your life you get through it and the next time you feel it you still believe that it's terrifying you still believe that this is this feeling that doom is upon you you still believe this dread and it's almost like paralyzing i mean there there are moments where so okay a few days ago allison and i flew to portland and then we just got back yesterday and we woke up the day of the flight it was 6 a.m the flight's at 8 30 and it's dark outside, it's dark in our bedroom. And I sat up and I said to Allison, uh, we're, we're not going today. And then from the darkness, her voice, uh, no, we're going. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Well, no, listen, while you were sleeping, I decided we're not going. Hey, you know, we're not going. And she's like, no, we're going. And then she gets up and she's getting ready. And I'm suddenly, this is the part that's wild to me, Jessica. Like, 
I start putting on like the shirt I'm gonna wear on the plane. I start zipping up my luggage, but I, wh while thinking, what am I getting ready for? We're not going. Like, no, we're not doing it. As I'm like bringing the luggage out to the car, I'm like, why am I doing this? We're not going. I was so scared. And if Allison wasn't with me, I, I wouldn't have gone. I mean, I just 100% wouldn't have gone. But what was I afraid of? That's like what you're asking. What are you anxious about? It wasn't about like a plane crash. It wasn't about missing the flight. It wasn't about um, what I had to do in Portland. Like it was for Daphne and books. What was it? I, no idea, but that doesn't matter. Each time around, the sufferer believes it as if this is true. And also a thought that you have is I've had anxiety before, but I've never been this freaked out before, but you have, but that, that doesn't do anything to quell it at all. One, so one thing, first of all, I have to um, let you know, because you did mention you are a basketball fan and um, she does get mentioned a few times in the book, especially like, I think right on the first page when Kit is yeah. talking about, Sue Bird is, uh, went to high school with me. Um, oh, she's oh, from St. Right. Yep. Seriously? She's been on the podcast. <laughs> Mind blown. Hey, are you serious? A hundred percent. Holy shit. She just uh, played like her last game recently. She did. Yes, she did. And um, she was, yeah, her, her mother was our school nurse, Mrs. Bird. And um, oh. Sue, Sue le I think she left because our, our basketball team was not competitive enough for her. Like she needed, so she went to another school her last two years, but Sue was definitely, she's from Syosset. She's done podcasts a podcast with us and we That's definitely so cool. were in school. We were, I was in school the same time. And this is so wild to me as <laughs> Sue Bird, Natalie Portman and John Lovett. It's like the weirdest, like, I feel like <laughs> we went to some weird place where like somebody's summoning successful. Like an alternate people. universe. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, like you wouldn't believe that all these people went to a public school together. If you saw it on television, you'd be like, that's not possible, but it did. But yeah. So Sue Bird is um, one of Syosset's own. Um, and um, that is yeah. absolutely, I was thinking about getting a, a poster of her just because I thought it'd be like awesome in the office to have it because she's mentioned like three times in the book. And, <laughs> yes. and yeah, I just saw that her last game. Anyway. Yeah. That's, that's mind bending. That is <laughs> unbelievable. There's a mention also in that book. Remember, obviously I wrote this a while ago. There's a mention of uh, Brittany Griner. And yes. that's the most flattering mention because it's it's talking about that mound of dirt in the cemetery. And it says, this grave is big enough for Brittany Griner. And like, I almost wish that I could go back and like change that or something. Cause I don't want someone to read that and think that I like, you know, have right. that it has anything to do yeah. with what's going on right now or something. So if anyone's listening, it had nothing to do with that. It just meant it was a very tall mound of dirt. I, I, I actually, in a, in a different way too, I thought about that because I watched the Foo Fighters horror movie, Studio 666. And, uh, you know, after Taylor Hawkins died, I'm like, oh man, I really shouldn't have watched this because I feel like going back and like looking at the movie, maybe, I don't know. Um, yes. Um, but um, anyway, back to Daphne and back to anxiety. Because <laughs> we, we cover a lot of ground in the, this is why we love talking to you. But no, there's, aside from yeah. that, I was saying to Jessica just before, I was like, there's a lot you could talk about in this book. It's very discussable. And like every, like, I feel like every two pages or practically every page, I was like, wait, let me like mark down this note. Cause like, I want to, you know, go down the wormhole of like looking into whether, you know, like female friendships, being an athlete because I was not one in high school or middle school or like ever and just different things of just like oh it made me think of this oh it made me think of this like I'm in a book club of workout friends and even though I picked the one we're discussing this week I'm like so I have another book for y'all like because the book is coming out September 20th for listeners it is it hasn't happened yet but it's it's going to be prepared and one of the one of the other things Stacy and I discussed, and this is something we can ask you about, is um, you reference Goblin in this book. So the book oh, yeah. is the, the town is Manhattan, but like we were kind of discussing how it almost felt like how Derry and Castle Rock are and mentioned. Stephen King. Yep, and Stephen King. They're sort of um, focal points in a lot of his stories. So I wrote a short story um, called. It was originally called the Gibbons Censor Board, but it. I changed it to Teenage Graveyard Night Watchman. It's about um, a, a new fangled uh, uh, device is put into the like sort of the 
the, uh, the cemetery grounds where each um, grave is denoted by like a light. And if, if somebody was buried alive by accident, that light will go on if there's, if there's human activity in the grave, right? And the story is a serial killer in Samhattan, a mailman gets, it's, it's, he dies, he's buried today. And the teenager is working and, and the, and that guy's light goes off. And it's like, wait, what do I do? So you're telling me that there's this like terrible, evil human being who was buried today and I'm now supposed to dig him up, right? So, so at that point I was like, ooh, this Sam Hatton, I like this like town. I wrote another short story in there. And what I liked about it in comparison to Goblin, Goblin to me is, um, what's the right word? More like, I don't wanna say colorful, but, uh, colorful, elastic, more laffy taffy. It's like, it's like richer. It's like, and Sam Hatton felt like a colder, there's a serial killer. There's a seven foot, you know, uh, ghost, whatever she is. There's, um, uh, you know, a mailman who removes people's mouths, right? Like Sam Hatton felt a little like more industrial, a little colder, a little like more whites and, and slates and grays and, and Goblin's a very colorful, rainy town. And I liked having that outlet. I liked having, so, Daphne takes place in Sam Hatton. So does all of the next book, Spin a Black Yarn. So does, well, the one after that does not, but it's, but it's, it's, it's close. It's in Chaps, who, if you remember in Daphne, that's the team they're playing to open yeah, the game. Yeah. So open the book. So I am starting to see this and it all for Michiganders, we always do it this way. I live here in Detroit. I imagine Bird Box took place somewhere here, like a river sort of through the, no, 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 closer to Detroit, like here. Inspection would have been up here in like the woods near like Lake Michigan's here. So and Milwaukee's across the way. I'm um, Barry Carroll would have been like up through here. And then Sam Hatton and Goblin are like dead center. Like I always just imagine them sort of dead center of the state and chaps and these other places. And it's become like Faulkner did that as well. I don't know how to say it like Yakna, Matapa County, whatever his county is. But I get why Stephen King and why Faulkner and other people have done this is because like, in in uh, this book that I wrote recently to just for the characters to drive to Sam Hatton for a day and to not only know the layout, but to also have sort of the overcast of like Randy Scott's and Daphne Van and, and you know, to have these, it's almost like the books in a way start helping each other out a little bit, if that makes sense. Like the setting is doing some of the mood setting for you. And so I get why, I get why writers have done this and I've been having like fun with it lately too. That's awesome. I like it because if someone like is just introduced to your work now and they could kind of be like, ooh, like I heard it kind of relates and has like a little bit of this. Let me go back and read this. It's a lot. I like it because like, you could like backlist the authors and be like, oh my God, I didn't know this existed. Where was I? Well, I think that it's also okay. And I wonder if these other people we mentioned would would agree or not. But I think it's okay to also like, it's, it's happening in real time, meaning... I don't think it's the end of the world if the next book describes Sam Hatton, like, like, like it's not 90 miles from Goblin, now it's 45. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, I think it's okay to like, um, adjust as you go. I don't think you have to have this entire world planned out. All right, there may be some like logistical inconsistencies. You said the courthouse is on the east side of the cemetery, now it's on the west. Well, it moved. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So Daphne herself, she's like such a presence, much mm -hmm. like anxiety. And, uh, you know, so like it opens and this, this girl, Kit, who's a basketball player, is recalling a story that her friend told her, which is like a local urban legend about this seven foot tall woman who wore kiss makeup and all denim. And he, the first thing she thinks of is Will Daphne kill me and of course you know she's thinking that as she makes the basket and she makes the basket and there's so much superstition I think in sports also um don't drop the spirit stick there you go uh you know that it, it just it felt so natural and the, the the imposing character of Daphne was so iconic just from like the moment she was described first of all like why the name Daphne why the name Daphne? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that I, okay. I, I, 
you know, if I sound crazy in what I'm saying right now, but I, I definitely wanted to make sure that Daphne wasn't um, sexualized in any way or or like a hot Halloween costume, you know, you, because somebody wrote something about that where they're like, what I like about Daphne is that this this is this doesn't matter that it's a woman. This is like a monster, you know, and I wanted that. But at the same time, her name, I wanted I didn't want it to be like, you know, I can't even think of like what would be like an, just an evil woman name, you know, uh, I'm trying to think like Cruella, right? Or something like that, right? So I wanted, I think I wanted her name. Somebody really, uh, if you're going to name your kid Cruella. <laughs> that, that's next level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, but can you can continue with Daphne? I, and so I think there was some sense of like just just the littlest bit of like you know dichotomy there. If we give her a more flower, well, not flowery, but Daphne is a sweet name, and and but also you know in the wrong hands could be a dark name. So so it, it resonated for me. I don't I don't remember thinking of it much beyond that, but I do remember thinking, hey, let's not let's not be too on point to name her like. Big Bertha or something like, come on, you know, like, let, let's like, let's be, let's give her like a name. I, I love it because it also makes me think of Daphne du Maurier, who again, mm. like that is no, not oh, yeah. at all. No. Yeah. Oh, I have her right here. Oh, right here. <laughs> Rebecca. Yes. <laughs> See, I didn't go that route because when you get her name, Daphne Van, I just was like, Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I I've thought about that after, but I thought of Daphne du Maurier also and how in, in a bizarre way, it's a it's a name in the canon of horror, right? But then mm -hmm. so is Shirley, but I, I don't think Shirley would have worked here. It's, <laughs> Shirley's on her way. And look it's what very I <laughs> It's, oh, cool. Ooh. WNBA ball right here for the for the reading coming up. Nice. I know, I'm excited. God, it looks it's, like weird and small right now in this video. Are my hands like huge? <laughs> <laughs> that is Daphne. So like bare hands, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. And, you know, go, just really quickly. Yeah, Daphne, it's a very, um, it's a very lyrical name. Daphne du Maurier is a very lyrical name. Oh, Daphne, sure. Daphne sure. Ben is like you have the, the softness of Daphne, but then like something a little bit, it, 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 it adds like impact to the end of it. And I love it. Yeah. Um, but so Daphne kills with her bare hands, which we are constantly told are huge. Um, it, it's interesting to have, like when you think of a slasher, and I know that this has been con you know, considered or described as almost like a, a, a slasher type story, but there's no slashing. It's all hands. Why hands? <laughs> that, you know, it's so funny. Like I said, I've never... I wasn't prepared for these questions. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm surprised that even the answers, but it's true. Like, where'd you come up with her name? Uh, why the bare hands? Um, I started thinking, what, how does she do this? What does she come with? And all these like things go through your head and you're like, well, has an ice pick been used? You know, you're like, stop it, stop it. Like, don't, you're like Googling like list of sharp objects, you know? Like what, what, <laughs> like what has been, no, no, it wasn't. I was like, it was in a sense, it's sort of like, not the anti-slasher, but the sort of the inverse, right? The inverse or something. And also to me, it like Daphne is the panic attack. She is the weapon herself. Like Daphne doesn't need to come with a sword. She is panic. She is anxiety. When she gets you like, she's, she gra she's got a hold of you with her. And anxiety doesn't come at you with like a needle. It like grabs you. And so that all just made total sense to me. She's not beauty. She's not grace. She will crush you. <laughs> crush your full face i don't know that that, that <laughs> fell apart at the end <laughs> no no that was great <laughs> yeah and also it's just kind of like cool for like carla mcgowan to be like what do you mean bare hands like no, no, no they're reading it wrong like what do you, this this could not have happened with bare hands this had to have happened with this or that and blah 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 so so that was like exciting too you know and also to have her bare hands on like the steering wheel when she died and to have the bare hands with which you you know you, you like you, you like you play sports with everything about it just resonated with me right away. Like this woman, no weapon. She is, she is panic. She is the weapon. I think that's really cool. Like I, I so just gonna like I like I will talk on numerous podcasts how I like horror stuff, but two of the things that really come to mind because we're really entering the season of spook and fall and everything is that 
every year I get excited. Um, there's a horror comedy group, the Merkins, and they always do uh-huh. like parodies uh-huh. of popular songs with horror like franchise characters. Like they do an Alice in Chains parody with Pinhead. Um, they do the Slash Street Boys instead of Backstreet Boys. So it's, I always get entertained by what they bring to the table. And I was just like, I could see them doing something for Daphne. Like, I think she's a very like interesting character monster whatever you want um her to be because I was just like oh that's interesting and when Jack's like yeah with her bare hands she doesn't really have a weapon that's her weapon I then I play um the video game Dead by Daylight where it's like hide and seek survivor um but it's a five player game and you're either a group of four of survivors trying to escape this nightmare realm and not get hooked to your death and sacrificed or you're the killer trying to kill everybody else in the game and they always have like a thing um and they do original characters and franchise characters like you know michael myers freddy krueger etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm just like how would daphne kill and like get all the people in the game because i'm already like daphne's got to be everywhere now like like how she's this legend in the book and getting all the readers to be like oh my god daphne oh my god now i'm thinking about her oh my god she's coming like jessica's <laughs> youth of oh my god bloody mary and Candyman. Like, I was the kid who was like, let's oh. go into the bathroom and summon them. I would oh. not have been friends with you, Stacey. Yeah, we I used to pretend have, to play Ouija boards, which not you do. <laughs> I would have terrified you because I would have spoken in a demon voice and pretended I was possessed. Oh, my God. You would have oh. scared the hell out of me also. I, <laughs> I, I think Jessica and I would have been, like, outside waiting and, and secretly kind of wishing we had gone with you. Okay. <laughs> Josh, you would you would have been my friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. It's <laughs> fun. Um, so Carla, so you mentioned Carla. So it's thing with her. I really loved her as a character. Um, just for listeners, Carla is um she's a police um officer and she's on the case of these disappearances and murders. Um, and the, so it's interesting. So Kit, here's the story of Daphne from her teammate. Um, and Daphne summoned by thinking about her, much like anxiety and, you know, mayhem ensues. But Carla is not from Samhattan and Carla has other things in her background. And in a way, it almost gives her an edge where in other places it might not. Um, were you were you thinking of Carla as almost like the anti-Daphne or was she just sort of dropped in the middle of mayhem? The, uh, I think that my, the thing that I really wanted from her was, is that, okay, she's from like an older generation and, and whereas now, and the girls keep saying, why do you think it's just a man? Why do you think that a man did this? And Carla's from a generation, where, where whether a woman or not, where she grew up where like only a man would do this or, or, or she would think something like this had to be a man. And I wanted someone that like just, was intelligent enough to keep looking and looking in all the right places, but also was from a generation of like, no, 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 it's not a girl. There's no, there's, there's no way this is a woman. Pit that against the young, the young, strong, independent, athletic women who are like, this is a woman. And I, and I wanted that. I wanted that thing. Meanwhile, McGowan is also a smart, independent, strong. And she's like the detective and she's good at it. And she's not only that, she even has a history of like crossing lines, like legal lines to get answers. I mean, that that side of her I really loved. Where I, where I, when I when I was like working on her, where I was like, oh what oh man, like she lies to people. Like you know, we'll give you this if you tell us this, and she doesn't give it to them. She's hit people in interrogations. So to have now that has her own variety of panic or hurry or distress or um, uh, impatience. Right, so you have Kit. There's a panic on the way. The whole town is freaking out. Carla's freaking out. I mean, it's like it's coming from like all angles. So I think for her, I I didn't want her to be like brand new to Sam Hatton, like like literally dropped in the middle. She's been there for like a couple years, but she was not there when this sort of communal um, uh, what do you call it? oppression the, or suppression? This communal suppression of the Daphne story, which again. And I know I don't mean to jump around too much, but Sam Hatton as a whole, it's not like everyone told each other, let's not talk about this. It was like a good, if you think of Sam Hatton as a single organism, a single mind, Daphne is like their issue. 
that they suppressed. And guess what? She's because of that, it's it's resulted in anxiety. And so, and and, I, and again, I, I don't mind saying it. it's like usually that's for someone else to like determine or something. But no, that was the idea. And so I think Carla not being during that eventually, as you said, has that edge, can recognize y'all are y'all are dealing with something here. <laughs> so yeah, we've covered a lot of ground and I'm sorry if the, the, the conversation, I'm sorry if the questions have been difficult. Um, well, no, 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 I mean, I, mean, I, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, just because just because <laughs> they're new. And also yeah. there is a fear of like a, of an author of like being too, um, uh, literal to revelatory, like this is what it represents. Cause then it's like, where's the mystery? But in this case, again, that that's what Daphne is. And so, and so this is my first time answering questions in a more like literal way, rather than what do you think, you know? And, and it's different, it's different. So like the denim and the face makeup and all of it, you know, like, did she sort of leap out fully formed? Like, yep. yeah, okay, yep. awesome. Yeah. Like in full, even, even like the idea of like, you can almost imagine like, I don't know, a glam makeup or kiss makeup, but over like the bloated blue face of a corpse, right? Like what a, whoo, what a, what a, what a thing that is, right? I kind of have here, let me show you something. Let me show you a couple of things in the office. I tried, and this this wouldn't be any definitive version of her, but I kind of tried a little bit to give some some glam makeup to a to a to a corpse. So here's one, and I also have okay. here in the office. I also have here in the office. That's just whatever. Just think about a Sam Han varsity jacket. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna be using this stuff in uh, awesome. the reading. We're doing the reading in a gymnasium. Yeah, I saw you publish uh, publicizing that on your Instagram because I might be a stalker, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Um, yeah, uh, in a gymnasium, we're reading at Center Court. There's going to be the the spirit of Sam Hatton, like the rock at Center Court, and that's where like our podium, we where we read from. And when people enter the gym, they're handed a ball and they're asked to ask the rim a question. So you know. And it'll be dark in there with fog machine. This is this will be fun. That sounds perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, so. I, I know Stacy had some questions about urban legends. I th um, well, because yeah. reading about it like that, because when you're first reading it, it's like oh, the story like you're at a slumber party type thing, which a lot of these things get passed on that way. But it made me think of one that's in New York, at least like maybe not. Long Island specific because it started in Staten Island was the legend of Cropsey. Like you have all these like urban legends, creepy pastas coming about, especially with the internet. Um, but like Cropsey was an escaped mental patient who supposedly abducted children to kill them. Uh, and that I was like, I was in sleep away. Like, I guess when you hear these urban legends, you are a young kid. You're not like, oh yeah, I'm going to a conference or like, you know, a literary conference and we're talking about this, like maybe depending on whatever program for that conference, it might be like the topic, but I'm not like hanging out at work. Like, hey, did you guys hear this story? Like, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I would like that. I do. Well, then I'll bother you on a break. But mm -hmm. like, to me, like Sleepboy Camp, it was like, yeah, you know, like you see, like we go into the woods, you see that like, ramshackle little shit think that's where cropsy lives it's gonna come get you or you know you're at your friend's house and it's like you say bloody mary three times she's gonna come out the mirror and you know slash you with her knife or fingernails whatever but that to me i was like ooh, like what kind of was there any specific type of thing that inspired you of an urban legend to kind of uh, do well, this the, uh, almost like the same exact things you're describing there was one at like the summer camp i went to and his name was i'm i'm sure it was like a some riff off the the Krapsy one because his name was Joe Krepsy. And so you had Krapsy with Krepsy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but he supposedly wore a flannel shirt. And I don't know, counselors like did it on purpose. I'm sure they did put it on purpose, but like way out in the woods, there would be like sort of like, you know, the torn bit of a red flannel shirt in the tree. And and I mean stuff that you know, you're out there with your buddies and you're like, we have to go back. Like, 
we are going to be murdered right now, you know? Um, yeah, I'm Bloody Mary and all that shit, but I wouldn't do it. I remember all the other kids going into the bathroom at our, uh, I think it was elementary school. And I, I wouldn't go in. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. Are you crazy? You know, I even, I don't even know if I would do that right now. Like, I don't know if I would go into the bathroom alone, <laughs> turn off the light and say the name three times. Because even if nothing happened, I'd be like, but did nothing happen? I get like, that's, I, that's the thrill of it. I, I know. The one thing I will say I won't do is I won't jerk. do Ouija boards because they freak me out. Oh, yeah. Allison, I, I, jerks. Allison, I, <laughs> use the biggest or like we're kind of monkeying around with like the biggest Ouija board in the world there's like it was in Tucson in this hotel hotel and there's photos of like we're playing twister on it you know oh my god and then I got freaked out I felt like something had like we had been toying with the wrong thing and we had to drive from there to Austin Texas and it was one of the most anxiety addled like we had to pull over so I could like like get my stuff together I felt like we had like screwed around with the wrong thing. And it, of course, Allison's like probably like rolling her eyes the whole time. Like, what are we doing, right? Like really we have to pull over again so you can like freak out about the world's largest Ouija board. <laughs> Cause he, you can never know. I will, I will throw that copy on in there. Like the other stuff I'll like do. And then sometimes I'm kind of like, did I, did I like summon something? Yeah. Like, you wanna know it? If I did, we'll have a party. It'll be yeah. fun. No, you're right. And that is the right attitude. If I did, we'll deal with it. All right. <laughs> There's not much else you could do. There's not much else you can like, do. What are you going to do? Sit there and stare into the darkness for the rest of your life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my, my other question is because I've, I've seen from looking up some of like the other readers reviews. Um, I, like others, got, you know, the early version of NetGalley. So thank you, NetGalley. But uh, a lot of people are saying like, oh, how come it's not necessarily marketed as YA since the main protagonist of the group, they're high schoolers. Would you see this as a crossover book? Would you promote to both? Oh, is it like I everybody would, read it? I would for sure 100% do that. I don't know that Del Rey is thinking that way yet because we haven't discussed that in any form yet, but I would 100% do that. Whereas... The argument can be made that Bird Box works that way just naturally, but this actually, as you're saying, the characters and the um, coming of age and these sort of things, this literally works in, in like both fields. So we haven't talked about it, but I would 100% like recommend it that way. Yeah, and, and try to promote it that way. Awesome. Yeah, and it, it does fit also, I mean, because whether you're remembering your local urban legends or, you know, this is like the, that age, Kit's age is the time when you're hearing all of these things. And it is a time of anxiety, even for, you know, teenagers who might not suffer from what we would consider anxiety, but growing up is Mm -hmm. anxiety you know being a kid being a teenager is anxiety and for somebody who has anxiety on top of that anxiety it's just it's just like one of the most perfect facets of the story uh, one of the things I'm curious about is um the idea of Daphne is like almost like generational trauma um, and people sort of like she kind of like goes back into the back of people's minds and people oh, it's it's almost like a spell like they forget about her but then they remember again um, I just I love that aspects of the story I thank you I I, um, I I liken it to like you know you know, if something traumatic or, or something, uh, no, I mean to belittle it when I say it in this way, but if something bad happened to you when you were like younger in this sort of way, and maybe you're older and someone brings it up and you're like, oh, oh man, I haven't, wow, I hadn't thought about that in years. Like I liken Daphne to that versus, um, we're not supposed to talk about her. No, 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 you haven't thought about her in years. And maybe you, um, you know, you go back, you drive by the house where, I don't know, I don't, want, I don't want to say like you were abused or something, but where something traumatic happened. You Maybe you drive by the house and you're like, oh my God, I hadn't, or you're out to dinner with your brother and it comes up somehow, he remembered it, but you hadn't thought of it. Daphne is that to me, that more vague suppression. And it wasn't an intentional. It was something really nasty happened in the, in the city of Samhattan so bad that everyone just sort of like, 
stop thinking about it. And then, they, uh, and, then, yeah. and then Natasha brings it up again. Well, at least for the girls, Natasha brings it up again. And now, and now here the trauma is returned in the form of a panic attack. A human panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you know, and one of the things that was great about it was for a while, I was questioning whether or not Daphne was an actual thing or whether she really was just an urban legend. Uh, because, you know, when you hear these things, like some people will be like, oh, a hundred percent, that was a real person. And then some people will be like, I can't believe you're like talking about that old story. Like I heard that that never happened. Yeah. Um, and I liked that there was like this, mo like a lot of like questioning in my mind as I was reading the story. Like I had in my mind, I'm like, there is no way Daphne is not real to Kit. There is no way Daphne is not real to these people and that these things are not happening but was but was that from something that happened or is it manifesting in real time and I loved that about the book awesome yeah that I you know I, I now I'm afraid I don't I don't want to do a spoiler but another similar thing I would hope that what you just said is the stories of Daphne are all a little different like one says that um you know, she was this innocent, you know, and she was bullied. Another one said right. uh, maybe she wasn't. By the yeah. end, just so the reader knows, by the end, we do know the score on Daphne and we do know the answer to these questions. But both of those things, the thing you're mentioning now and whether or not she is, um, what's the right word? Justified in being the way she is, you know, or if she's just inherently just dark and evil, um, all those things that was fun to play with while like writing for sure so uh stacy do you have another uh something else yeah no because i saw um this is going back to me stalking your instagram um one of your reviewer readers fans um made a spotify playlist for the book oh yeah that yeah um at voided lux is the person and i i love that the first song on it is a kiss song um but would you ever do your own playlist and would it yep. be a playlist that like read along playlist or just music that inspired? Okay. It's uh, what a great question because today I I'm not kidding today. I need to come up with the playlist for the reading. Right. So, and what we've been using so far and it's excellent for this, it's going to sound like self-reflexive or something, but we've been using the soundtrack for bird box. Why? Because the bulk of that soundtrack, it's it's eight vinyl sides long. Okay, that's it's four albums, that that soundtrack. And it for the most part, there are peaks and valleys a bit, but for the most part, it's a singular mood that is sort of building. And to me, that exemplifies Daphne more than you know, um sudden violins or something, you know, like like sometimes when you listen to like a soundtrack or something it'll be like steady and then crazy because a scary scene happened. And then, and then maybe even a pleasant scene before the next scare. But Bird Box, the soundtrack is just a steady, dark vibe. And so using some of that, but in terms of, you know, rock and roll and that kind of thing, we have a marching band opening and closing the show with hopefully like a rush song or a kiss song or that kind of thing so again imagine the dark gym fog a, a 20 person marching band playing kiss and then the bird box music out of that room and then kids at the free throw line you know standing at the free throw line there's no time for you know and you know so that that's how it'll go so i kind of have that task upon me today but i would i think that's a like um not only is that a good question but it's actually something I should do is what you said. Like, why not make a playlist? Why not have fun with this? And it doesn't have to be songs mentioned in the book. It could be what the book makes you feel like or, or, what, or you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be so literal. That's exciting. Oh, I like that though. Cause it's, it's something as a reader, well, I like music in general, but as a reader, it kind of like adds to the story for me, whether it's something to read along of like, <laughs> hey, these are songs that, either the writer was inspired by or the writer loved listening to. And these are like the character's favorites, yada, yada, yada. It's just fun to kind of be like, ooh, let's explore. I had Pretty Hate Machine on on repeat during that 
it's that whole scene where Kit recounts the the 911 call. I I have this record player right here. Here, you guys want to see it? Right there. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of Daphne's. Um, and I just on repeat, like I, I like while I was writing that scene of her calling and listening to each song and her thinking about it and all that. And also, by the way, I like that her parents had that album. <laughs> like that's kind of like definitely. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, 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 I could have spent a little more time with her parents, I think, because they say, oh, maybe, the, maybe they'll be in another story. We'll see. Maybe they have their own, their own whole story to go through. So that's actually, so really, like, kind of uh, bringing it to some sort of close, because we could literally talk forever. Um, <laughs> where are we, so where are we going next? Um, in the Mallerman verse. <laughs> okay, so Spin a Black Yarn is the name of like our production company, me and Ryan Lewis, my manager, but we got that name from a collection um, that I had written. But that collection, it was a group of novellas. Those are, those have all been like put out in like different places. Now there's a new group of novellas. So Spin a Black Yarn is a collection of novellas that all take place in Samhattan. And there's half the house is haunted. There's Igorov. Oh, I can't wait. I just I can't wait for this all to like come out. And um, and it was fun to spend more time here. Again, I think that you know some of the topography has probably changed a little bit, but to spend more time here after after having written Daphne, because that's mentioned like the you know this town had, had to deal with this some Daphne character, and then this town had to deal with Randy Scotts, and this town had to deal with Ben Evans and this kind of thing. So I think if I'm not mistaken, and if, and if I did everything right, that spin of black yarn sort of like galvanizes like sort of like the goblin chaps, Sam Hatton, like world. So that is coming out a year from now ish. And I just wrote incidents around the house, which I hope comes out after spin of black yarn incidents around the house. Yeah, I'm so excited about that one. That sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I just love, I just, I love it. I'm so excited. Um, wow. Uh, this has been really awesome. Thank you so much for spending the time. Yeah. With Thank oh you my for God. writing awesome Chatting books. Away. All the best. I mean, yeah. I just, you know, again, I hope, and I've said this for the fifth time now in this interview, I hope, I hope I'm not too, um, like, like this is what it's about or revelatory or the, no it was perfect i'm not used yeah. to being this way and it feels it doesn't feel naked it feels a little bit like like josh you're not supposed to say this kind of stuff but in this case what am i gonna like to, why am why be coy like yes listeners and readers daphne the novel is about anxiety and daphne is a is, is a panic attack on our way to kid and that is just that is the truth so well, she's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there, like, there's, there's a lot more that I'd love to talk about, but the problem is that um, I Spoilers. really don't want to spoil it for people because I found myself just so absorbed in this book, and everything that sort of happens. Like, there's characters that it's the type of book yeah. as you're reading, you just block out the world around you, which for me is problematic just because I have a puppy and a young child and they kind of need my attention but like it's just you you're literally like I had it on my phone from Nick Ellie and I'm just literally like okay like yeah whatever like what you said something to me like because you just get so absorbed into it pretty much from the get-go it's not like to me I didn't think it was so much like you're in the game this is happening and then everything that like happened after awesome awesome oh uh, i can't you know thank you too enough and when you wrote me jessica again i was like yeah let's roll because Woo! I, you know, I was I so love, excited i was so excited I, I she told me she's like i read the book like, we're gonna have a bond and i was like oh yes oh i'm in i'm in because you're always such a pleasure to talk to and your books i like you you said in this interview like you know this is what it's about but it's interesting to talk to see the viewpoint of whether, you know, the reader could interpret whatever or like, no, this is how it is. It's, you know, evolution in writing and and reading. And it's just, it's fun to talk about. And you're always a pleasure to have as a guest. And we want to annoy you for all your future books. Sounds amazing. I would love to see you guys in person. Jessica, maybe we could have a panic attack together. Oh, that would be great. (laughs) I will help 
induce a panic attack by right. chanting you're, Bloody you're, Mary and Candyman. Yeah, yeah, right. I you're will hope the one Candyman. That if, it. Honestly, if Candyman <laughs> was like real, it would have to be Tony Todd for me just because I love him. But all all the fun stuff. I don't know. Let's go like searching for the Blair Witch. Like, Oh, I mean, we have we have um, Mount Misery Road near us. That... All right, that terrified me when I was younger. And it, okay, quick story, listeners, if you're from Long Island, you'll know. And we also had a program a while ago. Mount Misery is like an area that there's a variety of urban legends for, and it's off of a road called Sweet Hollow Road, where there's a day camp, there's a cemetery, there's an Whoa. overpass of a parkway, and the whole thing is like you have to like put your car in neutral and the ghosts of children who were on a car crash of the overpass will push your car out of danger. It, it's really, it's because of like how the road is, like your car will move a little in neutral. I was so nervous to do it myself. I made my friend drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> like, see, I will get freaked about some stuff, but it just, you know, stuff like that. It'll just, it'll just be fun. Or like, I don't know. We yeah. could be, yeah, I sure. don't know if I, yeah. I want to summon Daphne, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. The the moment where um, you know, I was reading through it for the scene the other day, and the moment where Daphne climbs the stairs by Melanie's mom, and Melanie's mom's like, "What's wrong?" And but it wasn't that. Is Melanie runs into her room, hears the door open and close, and turns around with like a pair of scissors and like facing a giant. And that's that was the moment where I was like, "Oh God!" Like I yeah, I wouldn't want to summon this either because like I don't I'm not sure. I don't even know if running away is going to do anything for you. I well, one of the other readers who reviewed was like, you can't really run away from it, right? And uh, like, just you know, like they a panic were, attack, you cannot yeah. run away from yeah. a panic attack. You can't. Like it's oh. it's gonna get you. And I and wanted I wanted to say I, I don't remember if this is in the book, but let me just say this real fast: is that one thing that Allison did help me with for anxiety. And if there's any listeners who like are, are dealing with it, there's one thing that she did one time. I was really having a rough three months and she was like, have you ever considered timing them? And is, I don't remember if this is in Daphne or not, but she's like, have you ever considered timing the, yeah, there may be a low hum of anxiety, but the, but the peaks, have you timed them? I'm like, no, who the hell's gonna, who thinks to do that? You're just sitting there like horrified. So she's like, do it, do it next time. I'm like, fine. So I did it. I, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, you know, and freaking hit a stopwatch, right? Seven minutes later, it ebbed a little bit. I was like, Okay, and so I told Allison it was about that was about seven minutes long. The next one that came, it was either later that day or the next day, and it was about seven minutes long. And then the next one that came, either that night or the next day, it was about seven minutes long. So suddenly, while we had mentioned earlier, the sufferer believes in the anxiety, and and just because you um, uh, endured it or survived it before, it doesn't mean you feel like you will now. But timing it changed something for me. Because now there was like a hard, um, linear approach to it. Like, can I endure this for seven minutes? And the answer to that is yes. So, so even in the throes and, and the blur of anxiety, the answer to that is yes. And even recently, when I was talking about that flight stuff, you know, the peak of it or whatever, I was thinking to myself, it's about seven minutes, about seven minutes, and it and it was. So, any listeners who who suffer from this kind of thing or just experience it and like, and it does feel like there's no solution. And I'm not saying there is, but knowing the duration of the peaks might help. And that's that. That's extremely Good interesting. Advice. Wow, that's amazing. I would have never thought about doing that. I know, I know. <laughs> Allison said that and I was like, what the hell are you just time them? Because it's so nebulous, it's forever. What do you mean time it? It's eternity. Oh no, it's not. It's about it was about seven minutes. So yeah, yep. Wow, good job, Allison. Yeah, well, she's really good like that. Yes, she is really good like that. That's amazing. <clears throat> thank you, thank you so much. This is great. I just appreciate all of it. Um, once again, this was Jessica with Turn the Page Podcast. Um, and my coworker, <laughs> Stacy. We and... just sound like you're freaked out by me. <laughs> I'm thinking because I'm starting to think about Daphne. <laughs> yeah, Daphne. Oh, the cover, the cover. Did you have any say in that? Yeah. No. I so, like, so I don't. So, so the cover. So it's like, bam. Typically, they'll send me um, like a bunch of ideas and they sent this and I was like, that's it. No, no, no. We don't need it anymore. We're done. And they were like, well, we have other. I'm like, no, no, no. That's it. We're done. That's the cover. 
And they're like, okay. <laughs> I don't even need to see another one. That, that was it. It's a great awesome. cover. Read it, everybody. So good. <laughs> or listen to it. It's also going to be audio. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll see you back very soon, Josh. And maybe in uh, person someday. Yeah. Yeah. And awesome. thank you both so much. Awesome. Okay. We are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.